Hello, everybody. This is John Allen. I'm the editor of Crux, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. We're online at cruxnow.com. That is cruxnow.com. I'm also the host of this show, Last Week in the Church, which, as you know, if you're a regular viewer, this is the show where we raid the journalistic fridge. We're looking for news that's a little bit old by now. It's kind of leftover stuff, but we take it out sprinkle over some spices and our secret Crux brand sauce and serve it up piping hot. Here's what we've got for you this week. First, red hats galore. Pope Francis announces 21 new cardinals on Sunday, simultaneously and paradoxically, making handicapping the next conclave both easier and much, much harder, <laughs> we will discuss. Secondly, the old guard takes a hit. Cardinal Angelo Sodano, Secretary of State to two popes and in many ways the captain of the Vatican's old guard, dies at the age of 94 last Friday. We'll try to analyze the impact of all of that. Sodano leaves behind a legacy that can best be described as controversial. Third, whiskey and the mafia. Pope Francis shoots from the hip in discussing immigration in the United States once again raising eyebrows and setting tongues wagging. We'll try to figure out what is going on. And finally this week, there is joy in Mudville. The city of Rome explodes in a paroxysm of exuberance over a local soccer squad winning an international championship for the first time in 61 years. There may be a lesson there for the Catholic Church. We'll try to identify what it is. All that and more is waiting for you on the other side, so please stick around. Well, listen, if you were watching this program in the United States, I hope you had a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. For the rest of you, happy Tuesday. By the way, one of the things that just blows about being an American working in Rome is that American holidays are not holidays here, so we still have to work. And Italian holidays are not holidays in the States, so we still have to work. Now, I know what you're thinking, which is, yeah, but you still get to be in Rome, so just shut up. And you know what? You probably have a point. So why don't we just get on with the show? We begin this week with Pope Francis's somewhat expected announcement on Sunday that there will be a consistory on August 27th. Now, a consistory in Catholic speak is the event in which a pope creates new cardinals. And by the way, that is the appropriate ecclesiastical verb. We say that the pope creates cardinals, which leads to the cynical old Roman joke that only God and the pope can make something out of nothing. But in any event, what the pope announced on Sunday is that 21 men are now set to become new princes of the church, 16 of them, are under the age of 80 and therefore eligible to vote for the next pope, to take part in a conclave. And as I said at the top, the, the interesting thing about these picks is that on the one hand, it makes forecasting the next conclave a little bit easier. On the other hand, it makes it much more complicated. Let's try to unpack each end of that. Here's how it makes things easier. Most of these cardinals are known to be reliable Pope Francis allies. For example, the new cardinal in the United States, Bishop Robert McElroy of San Diego, he is seen as one of the more progressive figures in the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, a staunch Pope Francis ally, cut from the same cloth in many ways as, say, Cardinal Blaise Supich of Chicago, Joseph Tobin of Newark. And so in that sense, he becomes yet another American cardinal who will be a reliable carrier of the Pope Francis agenda. Arthur Roach, the new British cardinal who is currently head of the Vatican's Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments, that's a complicated name that basically means it's the Vatican Department for Liturgy, Cardinal-designate Roach is also seen as a progressive and a reliable Pope Francis ally, and we could go down the line, but this, this group of new cardinals would be seen largely in those terms. 
And in fact, one of the interesting things about this consistory is the way in which Pope Francis bypassed traditional places that have cardinals in favor of more obscure places that are quite close geographically to those traditional centers of power. And yet these other places are led by figures who are seen as closer to the Pope. So in the case of McElroy in San Diego, San Diego is about 120 miles away from Los Angeles. Los Angeles is one of the largest and most complex archdioceses in the world. It's been led by a cardinal since 1953. And yet, Pope Francis once again bypassed uh, Archbishop Jose Gomez, in this case in favor of the Bishop of San Diego. Why? Well, among other reasons, because McElroy, as I said, is seen as a strong progressive. Gomez would be seen as a little bit more conservative. We can say the same thing about Nigeria, where Archbishop Ignatius Kaigama of Abuja, the national capital, a city of about 3.6 million people, did not get the red hat. Bishop Peter Okpaleke of Ekulobia in Nigeria did. Ekulobia is a city of about 100,000, but the difference would be that Kaigama is seen as a bit of a conservative, especially in issues of sexual morality, also the relationship with Islam. Maybe the clearest case would be here in Italy, where Archbishop Mario Delpini of Milan, which has been led by a cardinal for centuries, did not get the red hat, but instead the Bishop of Como, which is 26 miles away, Bishop Oscar Cantore got the red hat and will become a cardinal. And again, Delpini would be seen as a somewhat conservative figure and not, therefore not necessarily a reliable Pope Francis ally. So bottom line is that in one sense, this conclave would appear to bolster the prospects that the next pope will be a continuity pope, that is, a pope who wants to continue the Pope Francis agenda. Also supporting that, uh, that hypothesis would be just the math. As of August 27th, Pope Francis will have appointed 83 of the 132 cardinals under 80 who will be eligible to elect the next pope. 83 is only four votes shy of 87, which is the two-thirds vote you would need in an electorate of 132 cardinals in order to elect a pope. However, okay, here's the however. First of all, do try to remember that the last conclave in 2013 was composed almost entirely of cardinals who had been appointed by John Paul II and Benedict, and yet they elected Francis. Second, you know, the truth is that because of Pope Francis's preference for reaching out to the peripheries, that is, trying to name cardinals in places that have never had them before or that are typically overlooked in, in global geopolitics. The truth, a lot of these cardinals don't have a high public profile and it's difficult to know what issues might be on the top of their mind when they gather to elect a pope. I mean, you know, this, this consistory includes cardinals from Mongolia and from Ghana two from India, from East Timor, from Paraguay, from Brazil. And in many cases, these are figures that, of, about which not a great deal is known. So it injects an element of uncertainty in terms of what might happen. Further, the truth is, many of these cardinals, because they are not well-known public figures and because they don't come to Rome very much in general, they just don't know each other all that well. I mean, we, one veteran Vatican cardinal recently said that when the last conclave happened in 2013, he estimated he personally knew about two-thirds of the cardinals who participated. This time, he said, he would know only about one-third. And that also injects a degree of uncertainty because it means when these cardinals gather for a conclave, they're not going to know one another very well. And many of them may not arrive with strong preferences. They may be learning as they go. I think that's probably one of the reasons that Pope Francis has asked all the cardinals of the world together in Rome for this consistory, not merely for the ceremony on the 27th, but also to take part in a couple of days of meetings afterwards, the ostensible purpose of which is to talk about the recent reform of the Roman Curia but also may have the effect of simply allowing them to at least begin to get to know one another 
a bit. The bottom line here is that in terms of trying to figure out what may happen for the next papal election, whenever that occurs, and of course we have no idea when that might be, but what this new infusion of cardinals does, on the one hand, it suggests that the basic idea of trying to find somebody who would carry forward the Francis legacy, it certainly strengthens the prospect of that. In terms of who that might be and what that might look like, God only knows. And, and that's part of what makes this an adventure, right? It, it's part of the fun of the whole thing is that we just don't know what's going to happen. All right, second story on the menu for this week. Late on Friday, Cardinal Angela Sodano died at the age of 94. Now, Sodano was a veteran Vatican figure. He had been part of the Vatican Diplomatic Corps. He eventually rose to the position of Secretary of State under both Popes John Paul II and for the early period of the papacy of Benedict XVI. Even after his departure from that position, he was widely seen as an extraordinarily influential figure in shaping the Vatican's internal culture, particularly in the Secretary of State, where many of his protégés and former colleagues continue to, to occupy positions of importance. To put it in colloquial terms, he was seen as the leader of the Vatican's old guard. Now, what do we mean by the old guard? Well, we're talking about a network of both clergy and laity who sort of see themselves as the defenders of the Vatican's traditional identity. So tremendous emphasis on the Vatican's autonomy, its sovereignty, also a kind of instinctive suspiciousness of outsiders, a kind of preference for doing business with people who were considered della familia, meaning of the family, no matter how qualified somebody in the outside may actually be, and basically people who are invested in defending the status quo and therefore allergic to attempted reforms, restructurings, overhauls, and so on. Now, the thing of it is, Sodano's death certainly is a blow to that old guard, but I would tell you, don't count it out. <laughs> because the, the, another defining feature of this old guard is that it has a remarkable capacity to ride out the storm that is to kind of write out attempted reforms and at the end of it to ensure that business as usual continues. We will see. In terms of Sedano's legacy, certainly there is controversy about it. There's controversy about his role in the John Paul II papacy. Many observers would tell you that Sedano kind of had an imperious style as the Secretary of State and essentially built his own empire and pursued his own agenda, which at times had only a tangential relationship with the agenda the Pope he allegedly served. There is criticism of his role when he was the papal ambassador in Chile during the Pinochet years, and he was seen as a reliable ally of the military regime and an opponent of Catholics who were pressing for change. Undoubtedly, the most controversial aspect of Sedano's legacy would be his role in the clerical sexual abuse crisis. For many years, he was a friend and ally of Mexican father Marcial Maciel de Golado, the founder of the Legion of Christ, who eventually was found guilty by the Vatican of various forms of sexual abuse and misconduct. Sedano was seen as Maciel's best friend in the Vatican. In a 2005 meeting with the then American Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, Sodano actually asked Rice to, to tell a federal judge that he had to throw out a lawsuit that had named the Vatican as a defendant in a sex abuse case. Rice was compelled to explain that in the American system, the executive branch can't tell the judiciary what to do. In 2010, Cardinal Christoph Schoenbern of Vienna in Austria accused Sedano publicly of having blocked a sex abuse investigation against Schoenbern's predecessor in Vienna, Cardinal Hans Hermann Grohr. Also in 2010, Sedano angered many uh, survivors of sexual abuse when he used 
a greeting for the Pope at the Easter Sunday Mass in the Vatican to accuse critics of Benedict XVI on the sex abuse crisis of engaging in petty gossip. There was also a strong suggestion that Sedano was complicit in ignoring charges of sexual abuse and misconduct against former cardinal and former priest Theodore McCarrick in the United States. You add all that up, the truth of it is Sedano was seen as a symbol of much that was wrong with the Vatican, particularly when it came to the sexual abuse crisis. Now, Sedano certainly had his defenders too. You know, many people would say that he loyally served two popes, that he was a strong Secretary of State. Even with regard to his defense of Benedict XVI, many people would give him credit, however ham-handed it may have been, for at least being loyal at a time when a lot of other people seemed to be jumping ship. But at the end of the day, it is nevertheless striking that even the Vatican's official communiques about Sedano's death, that is what was published by Vatican News, the state media here in the Vatican, or, for instance, the Pope's own telegram regarding Sedano's death, none of them actually praised him in any particular way. They just kind of offered a, a summary of his career. And that is a sign that in some ways he had become toxic. Now, his departure, as I said, certainly is a blow to the old guard. But as I also said, don't count them out. In fact, it may actually put the old guard in a somewhat stronger position because now they no longer have to be burdened with the controversies that surrounded Sedano for much of his career. We'll see. All right, third this week, whiskey and the mafia. So Pope Francis this past week held an audience with the International Solidarity Fund. This is a group set up to generate funds to raise money on behalf of some of the world's most marginalized and forgotten people, including migrants and refugees. Now, the Pope, as he often does in situations like this, disregarded his prepared text and just went off the cuff. And he told a story about once running into an American, somebody from the United States, who said to him that we're not really immigrants in America because we've put down roots there. And Pope Francis said that his response was, don't forget your history. You, you actually are immigrants. You're a nation of immigrants. And he said, for example, the Irish brought whiskey to America and the Italians brought the mafia. Now, okay, first of all, this is historically inaccurate because both whiskey and organized crime were in the United States well before the Irish and the Italians got there. And secondly, it was perceived as offensive. It brought howls of protest from what you might consider the usual suspects, that is, organizations that represent Irish Americans and Italian Americans, both of which said that, you know, this comment just perpetuated negative stereotypes about those immigrants. Three things, I guess, I would say about this. Number one, wouldn't you hate to be one of the Pope's paid communications professionals, one of the Pope's paid PR people, because you would have to go to bed every night in a cold sweat worrying about the next thing your boss was gonna say that you had no idea was coming and that you're gonna have to scramble to try to spin in some way. I don't know if there is a patron saint for PR people, but if there is, whoever he or she is, we should all say a quick prayer today on behalf of the people who, communicators who are on the Pope's payroll, because let's face it, they've got a tough gig. All right, second observation is that look, part of Pope Francis's charm from the beginning has been his spontaneity, right? That, that he's not beholden to the way popes normally talk and act, that he challenges convention, he bucks tradition, he's a maverick. And that's what, part of what has made the world fall in love with this figure. But the thing of it is, we got to be consistent about it. If you like the fact that the Pope shoots from the hip, you've got to accept the corollary that sometimes when he shoots from the hip, he's going to miss his target, right? And you can't both encourage his spontaneity when he says things you like and then get mad when he says things he doesn't, right? You just have to accept the fact 
that sometimes there are going to be misfires, right? It's just part of the deal. And, and the third observation is that although some people got upset about this, in the main, th there wasn't much, you know, of like popular outrage. And why is that? Well, it's because Pope Francis is insulated from this kind of criticism because, let's face it, nobody questions his street cred <laughs> as a champion of migrants and refugees. Nobody is going to think that just because he said this one thing that's a little dubious, that that means he's not fundamentally on the side of migrants and refugees, just like Pope Francis has sometimes said things over the years about women that some feminists have found a little tough to swallow. But in the main, his reputation is as a champion of women's rights, and especially women's empowerment within the church. And so he sort of tends to get a free pass in a way that if other leaders said things like this, you know, a ton of bricks would fall upon their head. And it's just, it's another lesson in how the narrative surrounding Pope Francis provides him with a kind of, what, a form of protection against fallout. Or put differently, it enables him to speak freely and without worrying about the consequence, consequences in a way that, you know, other leaders might not be able to pull off. In any event, the bottom line here is, look, is this going to be the Pope's most shining moment? Probably not. But does it change anything fundamentally in the way we perceive Pope Francis again? I would say probably not. Finally, joy in Mudville. All right, this is a reference, of course, to that famous American poem about baseball. There is no joy in Mudville because mighty Casey has struck out. Well, in this case, Mighty Casey parked it in the bleachers, okay, because the, one of the local soccer teams, Roma, which is the team of the people here in Rome, it won the Conference League Championship last Wednesday night, beating the Dutch squad Feyenoord by a score of one to nothing in a game that was contested in Tirana, the, the capital of Albania. Now, in many ways, that ch the, the championship is not really that big a deal. First of all, consider that the Conference League is the third tier of European competition. It's basically designed for teams that weren't good enough to make it into the top two tiers. Secondly, consider that Roma has had a very mediocre season. They actually finished in sixth place in the Italian competition. One point, by the way, behind their hated crosstown rivals of Lazio, which is a bitter pill for many Roma fans to swallow. And consider also that the final match Wednesday night was not a particularly inspiring affair. I mean, the, the one goal that Roma scored, Nicolo Zaniolo, young kid, 22 years old, it was a glorious goal. But I mean, other than that, it was a pretty boring game, to be honest with you. Despite all of that, the city of Rome erupted. I mean, Wednesday night until the wee hours of the next morning, the, the celebrations and the euphoria in this city was just palpable. On Thursday, you couldn't get across town because Rome's Cerco Massimo was inundated by like 100,000 Roma fans who were just, you know, I mean, the, the spontaneous exuberance was just off the hook. Now, what is the lesson in all of this for the Catholic Church? I mean, aside from the fact that all this occurred in the Pope's backyard, I do think there is a lesson here. Look, the Roma Squadra is known for one thing, disappointment. It, it, look, Rome is one of the world's great cities. Lots of money has been spent on this team over the years, and yet they have consistently underachieved. The last time they won the Italian championship was in the year 2000. So we're talking 22 years ago. Their last international trophy was in 1961. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the pre-Vatican II era. If you are a fan of Roma, what you are accustomed to is disappointment, failure, mediocrity, and heartbreak. And yet, when Rome finally won something, However relatively insignificant this championship actually was, the city erupted and Roma fans, I mean, you could walk down the street and if you were wearing the red and yellow of Rome, 
complete strangers would walk up and hug you, crying tears of joy. What does this suggest to us? What it suggests is that people who see themselves as committed to an institution, whether it's a soccer team or a church, people who are committed to that institution, in the blink of an eye, they will forgive centuries, decades of disappointment and failure and mediocrity and heartbreak if you but give them something, however minor, to cheer for. That was the case of Roma, and I would suggest to you it could be the case of the Catholic Church. If we just give Catholics something to cheer for, I think we all will be astonished about how readily so many of them will forgive all of the reasons the Church has given them in recent years for being disappointed, frustrated, divided, unhappy, disappointed. The truth of it is, just like sports fans want to be happy about their team, no matter how much recent experience suggests they shouldn't be, Catholics want to be excited about their church, no matter how much recent experience may have dissuaded them from that emotion. So, all I can say is that I hope people in the Vatican were paying attention Wednesday night when the sounds of honking cars and reveling fans invaded what is normal, normally the preternatural quiet of the precincts of the Vatican and reminded them how much people are ready to fall in love once again, if only we give them some reason, however minor, to do so. All right, that is the show for this week. Thank you for being with us. We will be here next Tuesday, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, you can find full coverage of all of these stories on the Crux site. Again, that is cruxnow.com. While you're on the site, you will find a handy dandy way to make a financial contribution to Crux if you were so inclined. And believe me, I would love you if you did it. Our independence is our most precious asset, but it isn't free. We need your help to pay for it. We especially appreciate those of you who were willing to become monthly contributors because that gives us the stability. It gives us the ability to make plans. It doesn't have to be much, five bucks, 10 bucks, whatever you can afford. But if you can do it, we would be deeply grateful. For the next seven days, my charge to you is stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again soon.